Hello people on the internet, G-String G here, and uh, it's September 11th. Now, do you remember where you were, what you were doing September 11th, 2001? Because I do. I was just getting off the back shift, decided to turn the TV on, just to have a bit of a, a background noise while I made something to eat, did a shower, go to bed. And uh, when I turned it on, I thought there was some cheesy Bruce Willis movie on, because uh, there was talk about hijacked planes and, and buildings and things, and I you know, just had me captivated thinking I was watching an action flick until I realized there's no main characters here and there's no real storyline. It was shocking to me, but what was also shocking to me is realizing that that shares an anniversary with a country on the other end of the planet. Uh, September 11th, 1973, Chile. Now imagine if you're waking up in the morning and instead of having hijacked planes crashing into a trade center, which is horrible, kills a lot of innocent people and so on. Imagine if the leader of your country is fallen under a military coup. You're trying to go to work, you're trying to go to school, you're trying to get along with your, your daily life, and all of a sudden there's tanks and armed personnel and your national military is firing on your capital building. And you know that your president is in there because your elected president is giving out speeches saying, clear the streets, get off the streets, stay home, don't get involved, this isn't your fight. That's what happened in Chile. Salvador Allende was an elected president of Chile. And although he fought a lot of scrutiny all the way through his political career, eventually he was elected democratically as the president of Chile. He was a leader of uh, the uh, well, Chile's version of a socialist party, or almost the communist party, and uh, they were uh, the Popular Unity Party, a very left-leaning uh, party that aligned themselves with the likes of uh, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, uh, Stalin, Lenin, Marx, all the writers and practitioners of uh, socialist and, and communist beliefs and, and uh, philosophy. Now, uh, Allende's crime, really, was when he decided to take over the mineral rights and take over the manufacturing rights of the country. And he did that to fund his plans. Now, his plans were the exact platform that he set out, that he got voted on, which was to work hard to provide housing, food, education, and medical care for the people of his country, a very impoverished nation, a third world nation at the time. And through his political action, it forced the, the active politicians, the, the, the house holding, the, the office holding, the elected politicians at the time, had to make drastic changes to appease the people of Chile to maintain their offices and to maintain their control over their part of Chile. So just the threat of him coming in made a lot of changes. But he didn't stop there. He kept pushing and pushing and pushing until he was elected president. And whenever he was elected president, he said, no more capital. No more will capitalist values impoverish the people of Chile. He watched it go from a third world country to a second world country just by the threat that the people would take control. Now he had the opportunity to make a difference and he started doing that. He even had crazy ideas like who would think that guaranteeing a quart of milk for every child in every household across the nation, guaranteeing that why would a politician go on that platform? Well, it means a lot whenever you're somebody living in a hut built out of whatever scrap aluminum you could find on a mountainside, and you're hoping that maybe you could get a decent pay out of the 18 hours a day that you're working six or seven days a week at the mine <laughs> would, would finally pay off and provide for your family. Well, Allende was that hero that wanted it to pay off for those families and wanted those children to go to school, get an education, and really propel the country further. This was a threat to a lot of other people that had other interests to take minerals, to take resources and things out of Chile. And with that funding and with, yes, the US government support, there was a military coup started. This military coup then appointed the leader of the military at the time who was believed to be, believed by Allende, believed to be a friend of the revolution that they were leading and believed to be a friend of the people. He turned out to be a cruel dictator and through his reign 
there was no elections, no democratic process, and people were massacred in the streets in the, in the days and weeks immediately following the coup. But over the years later, there was more and more people going disappeared. Many reports of people being picked up off the street, dropped out of helicopters in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, left to fend for themselves in the open ocean, never to be heard of or seen again. Uh, they found mass graves in jungles. They found bodies uh, strewn across mountainsides and things. They're still, still finding bodies. There's still people missing, and there's a monument to the missing. People still gather on this day in Chile and share photos of their long-lost loved ones, hoping that somebody has any information on where their body can be found, or hoping that they escape to another nation somewhere, somehow secretly. There are still people living in refuge in countries around the world. Some of them are friends of mine living right here in Canada, still scared to go back to Chile, even though Pinochet, the cruel dictator, has been removed from power, has died, and has been buried in Chile, only to be dug up and reburied again somewhere else because his ashes aren't welcome there. He actually had to be cremated so that people wouldn't decimate the body. That's how much the people of Chile hate this guy. Now, there are some people that are Pinochetistas, but hey, nowadays there's still people that are Nazis. I don't see the difference. But one thing I can say is that this now overlaps a third anniversary, because this being September 11th, last night you probably watched what Obama was saying about how he's now backed off in the tough talk with Syria, he's not going to do any sort of military action, he's not going to hit the military compounds and things in Syria, he's going to wait and try this whole Russian idea of turning over the weapons and, and so on. Well, I'm here to tell you, that's not just a Russian idea, that's a common sense idea. Try talking to people. And if the Syrian government says, hey, we're not using chemical weapons and we don't need to use chemical weapons, then they have no problem giving them up, right? And so why not just go and say, hey, Assad, we hear you got some gas uh, sitting around doing nothing. If you're not using it, you got no plans to use it, why not just uh, lock it up under international control for a while? Let us see that you are the stand-up guy that you're saying you are. And I have to applaud Russia for saying, let's give this guy a chance and let him take care of his own issues in his own country. Because guess what? He's a democratically elected leader. Yeah, the U.S. is trying to bring democracy by destroying democracy. Now, that I don't agree with. And the polls are saying the American public doesn't even agree with it. So good on you, American public. You're starting to learn exactly what democracy is. It is the will of the people. So, if you want to understand who Assad is, you have to understand who he represents. He represents the people that voted him into power. And if you really pay attention to Assad and, and you want to know what's going on in Syria, then you have to know he is the leader of the Ba'ath Party. You might have heard that name before. Yeah, it was referred to as a terrorist cell before by the U.S. government. That is not the case at all. It is a legitimate political party in Syria, and the Ba'ath Party, the reason why they're called terrorists is for the same reason that a Yande was called terrorist. Yep, socialist roots. So, with socialist roots, that means that there's no room for capital, right? Wrong. The Ba'ath Party is not fully socialist. They actually do believe in capitalism. They just believe that the people that control the capital should also be in control of the people that they provide the capital for. That means that if you're going to have somebody working in your factory, you have to make sure that they're fed and have a home and that their family can get an education. So it's kind of like socialism turned around and forced to say, hey, if you want to be a capitalist, you want to be a multimillionaire, then you have to spend your millions on the people that are making your millions. You can't just keep it. It's kind of the in-between road of the government will provide the money for everybody and free capital will provide the money for a few people and, and we don't really care what the people get lost in the fold. This is the in-between step saying, okay, we'll let you make your money, but you're going to have to spend it on the people that are making the money for you. So really, the Ba'ath Party is the centralists in this argument. And the U.S. government's even trying to crush that. Yes, the U.S. government is backing the rebels. They have supplied weapons, they've supplied training, they've supplied funding. 
openly admitting this. And then they say that they're going to bomb military targets in Syria to destroy chemical weapons, but not to aid any rebel forces. No, 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 no. This is to put people on an equal playing field. Well, I ask you this. For the people that are out there, any military experience or any experience at all around a military base, how many military bases or institutions do you know of that serve only one sole purpose? How many Air Force bases do you go to that have only this type of airplane and they provide no other services? There's no civilians working on the base. There's no other military personnel around. This is all they do is store this type of plane and that's it. Well, you know that that's a bunch of bull. So, whenever they're targeting these military installations, they're also targeting the army, they're targeting navy institutions, they're targeting civilian populations, they're targeting so many different things other than just chemical weapons. And that's not because Assad put people there, that's because that's how military installations work. So, understand that this whole plan that the US came up with, that let's just bomb them into peace, is not going to work. And a different Lenin had it all right when he said, give peace a chance. And today, on the anniversary of the US-funded military coup in Chile, I ask that you really look into what's going on in Syria. And the similarities just might surprise you.